question to Ms. To Professor Jean Bosco. Yeah, good afternoon. Okay, thank you so much. So we will start in about two minutes. Um, we will start on time. You both can hear me well? Yes. Okay, great. My video is not the best, um, but, but you know, this is the best I could get, so. Oh. It looks great. Everything's all small thumbnails anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, hello, Adam. Hello. Good to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm uh, looking forward to uh, hearing both of our presentations next to each other. I think it'll be a good pairing. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Great. Then have you admitted everybody or um, it will be at seven? Admitted, most of them have been admitted. Uh, we'll just uh, uh, wait for the rest to be able to log in as we go. Okay. As we go by. Um, I'm sure they will be coming in as time goes by. Um, maybe just if it will allow, I'm sure we will have uh, people joining and uh, as we proceed. Great, then. Thank you, sir. We had more than, maybe just to inform, we had more than 120 registrations. Wow. We're hopeful that uh, they'll join us. I'm sure it's because of the challenge of it, either being lunchtime and people being a little bit busy, but they'll join us as time goes by. I will also do a reminder from the Zoom links to them, and I'm happy to see that they are continuing to join. I'm sure by 12, 2.35, they'll already be in. As mm -hmm. it is the introduction. Thank you. Should you, I mean, uh, would you advise me to start uh, like in a few minutes or would you like to give us uh, a little bit, give a little bit of time? Maybe uh, as practice, we usually start on time. I will request we start uh, since it's usually practice. Uh, since mm -hmm. we're doing the introductions right now, and then we'll proceed to the actual um, presentation. Um, presentation maybe after like five five to ten minutes i'm sure they will have joined in and also mm. thank you for the participants who've already joined in thank you very much then i truly appreciate uh, everything you have been doing behind the scenes um behind the scene rather um and uh, i want to acknowledge mr philip okungu um thank you very much for being here so without any thank further you. ado, thank you, Maria. Thanks and welcome. thanks everybody, Adam. Thanks, yeah, Jean Bosco. Thank David. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, without any further ado, I would like to start this webinar by saying hello you, and welcome, welcome to today's ASAM ARSO webinar on robotics, automation, and automate autonomous systems. Thank you all for taking time to be here today. Uh, my name is Maria Givaraj. Uh, I'm a manager for global cooperation and training at ASTM International. We are based in West Coast in Pennsylvania in the United States. And I'm delighted to be your host today. We have two great speakers today. The first speaker will cover ASTM International Committee F45 on robotics automation and autonomous systems. And the second speaker will answer the question, how African countries can benefit from international standards under robotics and autonomous systems. The selection of the main topic of this webinar, which is robotics, automation and autom autonomous systems, stems from, a, from your own responses to an ARSO survey that was sent early this year, where four other topics were selected, including additive manufacturing, textiles, petroleum, and nanotechnology. So together with today's topic, that makes five. The first two topics were successfully uh, covered in April and June, respectively. And the last two are scheduled for October and December of this year. This is, like I alluded before, this is part of an ASTM ARSO webinar series scheduled for 
2022 alone. We hope to have more webinars uh, at some point next year because these webinars not only are very important, very successful, but um, a key to the memorandum of understanding that we have uh, not only with ARSO since 2015, but also with a variety of uh, MOU partners across Africa. Before I introduce you to today's panelists, I would like to, on behalf of ASTM International, express our sincere gratitude to the African Organization for Standardization, ARSO, for teaming up with us today, as they have done previously, in other collaboration areas. As I alluded before, our partnership dates 2015, when both institutions signed an MOU. And this partnership has indeed been very, very uh, successful, and we have made tremendous uh, progress to date. Before I uh, invite Mr. Okungu to um, give us the opening remarks, I would like to go over a couple of uh, housekeeping items. The first one is that we'll have two panelists, like I alluded before. The second one is that each panelist will have 30 minutes to present. The third item is that all attendees will be on listening mode only during the webinar. And fourthly, I would like to request that all uh, attendees refrain from using their cameras uh, as to avoid bandwidth problems and connectivity problems. So the, the last point is that uh, uh, I will invite you to use the chat feature to submit any questions you may have. And please note that interpretation from English to French and vice versa is available in today's webinar. So you can select the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen to and, and select the language of your preference. At the end of the, all the presentations, we'll pause for 15 minutes to answer any questions that come in, that might have come in. So please feel free to submit those questions uh, in the chat box at any time. Without any further delay, I would like to invite Mr. Philip Okungu, ARSO's documentation and information manager, charged with official information documentation communication and member stakeholder networks and outreach through the office of the Secretary General, Dr. Hemogen Sengemana, who could not be with us today. So uh, uh, before I hand over uh, to you, Mr. Kungu, I would like to say a few words about you. So Mr. Philip has been with ARSO for 21 years, and to date he has been working closely with the Office of the Secretary, Secretary General. He has undertaken various professional courses in quality infrastructure, including WTO e-learning QI courses and QI course offered by PTB on quality infrastructure and sustainable development. Mr. Kungu has represented ARSO in various regional and continental as well as international standardization uh, forum including leading ARSO in its application, discussions and presentation on the quest for admission into the WTO TBT Committee Observer Membership in 2015. Finally, share with you that Mr. Kungu holds a master's degree in library and information science and a bachelor's degree in education, which he got in 1992 uh, before he got the first degree. And both degrees are from Kenyatta University in Nairobi and various professional qualifications in standardization quality infrastructure. And his keen interest is in international relations, standardization policy and trade. With that, Mr. Kungu, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Maria, for that elaborate introduction about myself, but mostly uh, for the uh, for the gratitude of ARSO and the ARSO fraternity. Uh, we wish to take this opportunity on behalf of the ASO Secretary General, Dr. Emogen Sengemana, who was supposed to be uh, doing the opening uh, remarks, but on his behalf, he allowed me to do so because of some commitments already that he had. Uh, we want to use this opportunity once again to thank the SGM, our partner in various initiatives that we have been doing for the benefit of the ASO members, as Maria has indicated. We signed an MOU in 2015, and since then we have held various initiatives and for which members have already benefited. Uh, for those who are not aware, ASO is an uh, intergovernmental organization which was founded by the African Union and the UNECA, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, way back in 1977 to facilitate standards harmonization together with the uh, conformity assessments. Uh, you realize that if you don't uh, harmonize the conformity assessment, then it will not be possible. If you don't, do, if you don't apply the harmonized conformity assessment into the harmonized standards, then the result will be nil. But we are going further into the issues of mutual recognition arrangements so that you have harmonized standards, harmonized conformity assessment, then recognition is great. But uh, coming back to our topic, I think uh, it is important to highlight that before we initiated the webinar series with the STM, we had uh, discussions with ASTM and the possible areas. Then it was uh, incumbent upon the central secretariat to approach the members and ask them the ones uh, which they felt were of uh, priority areas and areas of interest based on their national visions and based on Agenda 2063 and the FCFTA agreement for which both ARSO and the national uh, members have obligation and rights in implementation. And they choose the topics. We have had, uh, I think, two series. Uh, Robotics should be the third. Then we have nanotechnology and petroleum, which will come finally. These ones were the choices in terms of priority by the members. So today we are happy to be implementing the robotics uh, webinar series uh, as per the choice of the members. And as you know, this one is a topic which is also dear to the African continent currently, based from the experience that we have had from the COVID-19 uh, with regards to manufacturing and with regards to industrialization. We know the role of robotics in manufacturing. So we, we are going to uh, focus on these topics and also focusing on the benefits when it comes to African manufacturing, industrialization, and trade. I want to highlight the presence of all ASO members, the experts, uh, the regional organizations. Uh, we welcome you all and thank you very much. I want also to thank our panelists of today for having accepted to be the panelists under this topic. And we look forward to a great uh, moment and a great uh, discussions out of this. With that, I want on behalf of the Secretary General to once more welcome you to this SOSTM webinar series on robotics. Thank you for now and let us engage further. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kungu, for your opening remarks. They were really great and uh, we look forward to your closing remarks at the end of this uh, webinar. Without any further ado, I would like to introduce our first panelist, Mr. Adam Norton. Mr. Norton is, a, is the chair of ASTM committee F45 on robotics, automation and autonomous systems. And he's also an associate director of the New England Robotics Validation and Experimentation, in short, NERV. N-E-R-V-E, -E, Center at the University of Massachusetts Lowell here in the United States. 
His research interests include the test and evaluation of robot, human and human robot performance and the development of metrics, test methods and benchmarking tools for robots. Adam has developed metrics and test methods and led evaluations for autonomous industrial vehicles, robotic manipulators, exoskeletons, response robots, unmanned aerial systems and human robot interaction and participates on several standards committees, including ASTM 45, F45, uh, which is the topic for today, and F48 on exkeletons and X suites um, area. With that, I uh, would like to give the floor to Mr. Norton. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I just want to make sure you can hear me okay, Every, and you can see my screen as well. Yes. Very good. So I'll, I'll say good morning, although for most of you, I believe this is more good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to, to participate in this. I'm uh, happy to uh, give a, a, an overview of the ASTM F45 committee, um, which has recently been actually expanding its scope quite a bit, um, which I'll talk about um, in a little. Um, while Maria already uh, covered most of this, um, again, my name is Adam Norton, Associate Director of the Nerve Center at UMass Lowell. Um, I serve on several different standards committees, uh, as well as work on other uh, robotics and manufacturing institutes um, like the ARM Institute. Uh, before I get into the ASTM F45 committee, I just want to very briefly tell you a little bit about the research center that I run over at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Uh, it's the NERVE Center, which is the New England Robotics Validation and Experimentation Center. Uh, and our focus is all on the test and evaluation of robot systems. Uh, we don't do too much in the way of developing new robot systems, but we do develop new measurement and evaluation methods uh, for robots across many different uh, domains. Uh, and those include some of the ones that Maria had already mentioned, uh, industrial automation, exoskeletons, wearable robots, uh, et cetera. We're a very multidisciplinary research center. Um, and because of that, our research spans many different areas. Um, this is just kind of a, a, a summary of some of the areas uh, that we uh, that we evaluate um, with a few uh, video clips of what some of our testing looks like. Um, we, we focus primarily on testing that is done uh, physically, meaning a system either being worn by a person, being operated by a person, uh, operating near people uh, in an environment, uh, and collecting uh, various streams of data to evaluate its performance at the ability to move through a space, to manipulate an object, to detect something with a sensor, um, et cetera. Uh, but the ones that we're going to be uh, focusing on uh, for today's presentation are these three in the bottom right uh, for anything that involves uh, industrial automation. So human robot teaming, uh, robot grasping and manipulation, and industrial mobile robots. Now, there are many other uh, types of robot systems that fit into these categories that have to do uh, more with uh, industrial manufacturing applications like uh, sanding or uh, pick and place for uh, a, a product fulfillment uh, line. And we are going to be talking about those as well. Uh, before we get into the actual F45 committee, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what we're all kind of uh, pushing towards as part of our uh, research. And that is um, some of the advantages that robotics and automation provide to the world of manufacturing. Uh, and most importantly, that is the ability to perform in the presence of variation. And what I mean by that is for a lot of industrial automation applications, uh, the reason why we want to utilize uh, robotics as opposed to a more traditional automation solution is they can adapt uh, to changes that occur as part of the manufacturing line. Um, we try to define these in these kind of four different categories, meaning if it's robust, then it can perform with 
kind of small changes, meaning maybe the object it's trying to pick up is changing locations just due to how it falls onto a uh, platform. Uh, adaptable, meaning that it is going to be able to reprioritize and change the method in which it performs a task based on uh, other external forces that may change it. Generalizable, meaning a robotic capability that maybe can be transferred between different robot systems or that you can use across multiple tasks, uh, which is a very you know, difficult uh, research problem. And then those that are improvable, meaning those that utilize things like machine learning that can learn and improve their behaviors over time. And this is kind of a scale into how these systems get more and more advanced. The way that we try to quantify these in some of our tests is we look at all of the different variations that could occur as part of task performance. Um, so for example, in this uh, top middle image here for conveyor picking, uh, this is a robot system that's gonna be picking up objects off of this moving conveyor. Uh, the system is gonna need to be able to adapt to variations in the position of the object on uh, the, um, on the uh, belt, the orientation of the object, as well as its shape. And, you know, there's going to be some variations there. So as part of our testing, we may define some test cases that uh, will uh, exemplify each of those different variations. Uh, same thing for pallet loading on the right, where now there is going to be uh, some difference in the way that the object being picked up is going to be uh, placed. Uh, but a lot of these are very known variations to the system, and it just needs to adapt accordingly. If we go into more mobile applications, like mobile robot navigation, then uh, now we're talking about a system moving through a space where it's got to avoid different types of obstacles. And each of these obstacles likely represent different forms of obstacle avoidance capabilities. We want to have ways that we can uh, quantify uh, and evaluate each of those. So this is kind of you know the 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 where we're going with a lot of the the future of our uh, evaluation in robotics and automation, um, which leads me to ASTM F45. Now this committee started in 2014, uh, and back when it began, it actually had a pretty narrow focus on driverless automatic guided industrial vehicles. Uh, and really what that means is uh, just different automatic guided vehicles or autonomous mobile, mobile robots. So really focused just on mobile systems. But last year, uh, we uh, voted to uh, expand the scope of the committee such that now it covers more broadly robotics automation and autonomous systems, meaning that this includes some of those mobile robots from the previous scope, but now we've added things like robotic arms and manipulators, sensors that are used in those systems, smart infrastructure, advanced manufacturing, et cetera. Uh, and with that, we've been starting to uh, expand what the committee uh, is covering in terms of its subcommittees and different standards. So just to kind of visualize what that really looks like is back when we were driverless automatic guided industrial vehicles, we were really focused on tests that looked like this. Uh, you're taking a mobile robot, uh, driving it, let's say, from point to point, and you need to evaluate its ability to navigate from a start position to a goal, uh, to avoid obstacles along the way, uh, or to uh, reach a certain position within some level of accuracy uh, towards the end. Now, as we've expanded, we have added uh, robot manipulation, which is our, our middle row here, which are, with, these are a couple of kind of example use cases of you know, robots picking objects uh, as part of an automation line, moving it from one platform to another, uh, evaluating some of the end effectors or robotic grippers at the end of the robot arm for their various capabilities, uh, or into more advanced uh, mobile manipulator systems like the Boston Dynamics Spot, which is the yellow robot dog shown on the right. Uh, which can do kind of a combination of the first two rows. And then even further, getting into more industrial automation applications, uh, this bottom row deals with a series of different robot arms for sanding, for um, uh, laying down uh, flexible materials uh, into uh, person tracking, things that may all occur uh, within uh, some type of industrial manufacturing facility.
And I just wanted to point out those first two rows. This is actually all uh, research that's being done in my research center at UMass Lowell. Um, and the bottom is from another organization called uh, the ARM Institute. I just want to quickly acknowledge all of the uh, committee officers within ASTM F45. Um, we've uh, been slowly building up uh, our expansion, adding several uh, members at large, which are uh, three different members from um, um, high impact industry that uh, are not serving in any leadership roles, but provide a lot of good insight to make sure that the standards we're developing are uh, relevant to industry. And then all of our uh, subcommittee chairs, and I'm going to cover what each of these different subcommittees are um, a little bit later. This slide is admittedly uh, a bit outdated. We've added uh, several members since, um, but what I just like to point out here is uh, the number of members that we have in each category. Uh, so there are um, several producers, users, uh, and general interest. We don't typically have users that are called consumers only because we're making things for industrial automation as opposed to um, products that would be used in the home. But we do have a good representation um, internationally from Canada, China, Denmark, Finland, Germany, uh, et cetera, and always looking for more. Now, the subcommittee structure of F45 is, uh, we, we've tried to cover a lot of the large areas uh, within robotics and automation uh, that can each warrant their own set of standards, um, some of which may apply to only one type of robot system uh, and others that may be more uh, generally applicable. Um, so for example, uh, environmental effects. Uh, this subcommittee primarily looks at standards that can be used to uh, evaluate the environment where a system uh, is being used. And we've looked at that uh, so far, primarily in the mobile robot use case, where we evaluate uh, aspects of the environment, such as the lighting conditions, where the, the amount of light, as well as its source, uh, ground conditions. Uh, this is showing uh, on the bottom right image uh, some examples of um, cracks or perturbations in the ground that the uh, system may need to either detect and avoid or may impact its mobility. Um, and uh, a series of other uh, characteristics as well, including um, any sort of network interference um, and anything else that could impact the performance of the system. Now in this subcommittee, the standards that are generated uh, don't necessarily perform um, an evaluation of the system, but just the environment where it's being uh, used such that you can determine if the environment is a factor in its performance. Uh, we've seen this a lot, uh, particularly with things like lighting conditions, where in very low light, certain vision systems will not perform very well, but also in very uh, high brightness, say uh, from uh, sunlight or even just a directed light um, can impact some of the sensor systems and not allow the systems to uh, perform correctly. The second subcommittee is on AUGV uh, docking and navigation. Uh, so what I'm showing on the screen here is just a, a couple of snapshots from one of our navigation tests. This is the navigation through a defined area test. Now this subcommittee is primarily focused on the mobile robot um, use case. Um, where we're developing standards that do not specify the way in which a system has to perform, but we standardize the way that you would measure and evaluate that system's performance. So what I mean is, uh, in this example, where we're showing a robot moving between two aisles, we are not setting a, a standard to say that it has to be able to perform this um, in a certain amount of time or at a certain speed. Uh, but rather we develop a standard that allows people to run their own tests all using the same set of parameters that they can tune based on the type of environment they want to run. Uh, so in this example, the aisle width, the length of the aisle, um, and the obstacles that may be in the path, those are all things that can be adjusted 
um, by the person running the test, uh, such that if their environment involves, uh, let's say, a lot of uh, other uh, moving obstacles or um, anything like that, then it'll be um, you know, potentially problematic. And we want to be able to put that into the test to evaluate its performance. Second is in the world of docking. So this is still a navigation test in that it involves driving from one point to another, um, except in our navigation tests, all we are really evaluating is its ability to, its ability to move through an environment and reach a goal. And the way that you reach that goal is just by crossing a line on the ground. It's very, very basic. In our docking tests, like what's being shown here, we get into much more uh, minute and precise measurements. So what's being shown on the screen is a uh, rendering of a ground vehicle that uh, maybe has fork tines, like, an, like a, um, a forklift, moving from one position to another. When it reaches that position, we are evaluating how precisely uh, certain points on the vehicle reach the desired end point. So in the uh, bottom right uh, uh, diagram, the goal points are those little red circles that are located on the uh, top and bottom. The uh, yellow triangles are uh, marks on the system that are intended to line up with, uh, with those markings. Uh, but let's say as the system is moving from one point to another, it may encounter some sensor drift issues that will uh, cause it to get off track. Um, and by the time it reaches its goal point, it, the system may believe that it is at its goal, but will actually be um, somewhat uh, off base. So by using this very simple uh, measurement method, we can determine to what degree it is uh, inaccurately placed, uh, whether that is uh, just uh, distance in X and Y, or if it's rotationally off. This will be very important for systems that are intended to uh, do something once they reach one of these goal points, such as using fork tines to pick up a pallet, um, or if they have a robot arm on top and they're expected to, to um, you know, manipulate something once they reach a certain point. If they're not positioned correctly, then they won't be able to do it. So this is, again, merely just a method to evaluate the accuracy of their docking, um, not specifying that it be done to a certain level of accuracy. Uh, F4503 is all focused on object detection and protection. Uh, so our um, focus here is on the ability of the system to uh, detect obstacles that may enter its path. Um, and in some cases, avoid hitting those obstacles, uh, or in others, it may be allowed for them to actually, um, you know, bump some of those obstacles without causing any damage. The images that are uh, shown on the screen, uh, the top right deals with a standard for measuring the system's ability to detect an obstacle in the way and uh, lower its velocity after the obstacle has been detected. So what you end up doing is as the system is moving down an aisle, you push this standard test piece uh, in front of it at a specific interval, and you evaluate the distance that the system uh, used in order to uh, go from uh, in motion to a stopping point. Um, and you repeat that you know, X number of times. Uh, another standard that we have is purely for uh, recording the characteristics of obstacles that you're going to use in a test. Um, so the bottom row of images is just a few examples of uh, just some very basic shapes that we specify that you can use to uh, specify the types of obstacles that you may encounter, um, such as uh, an open box, uh, a table, a chair, uh, things that can cause different issues for the systems based on how they use their sensors. F4504 is uh, less specific to ground vehicles and uh, is applicable to any sort of uh, intelligent system that might be used in a manufacturing environment. And what we look to do here is uh, evaluate the wireless uh, connection between uh, any of these distributed systems in a manufacturing space. 
So the, the diagram on the right is a very uh, kind of simplified representation of all of these kind of possible connections, whether it's between, uh, let's say, a mobile vehicle and a cloud controller, something like a, you know operating over Wi-Fi, or it could be uh, a robotic arm on a pedestal that is connected to uh, its computer that's waiting for maybe some input from somewhere else within the facility. And what we've developed so far is a, a test method so that you can uh, implement different impairments to this communication line. Uh, for example, uh, lowering the amount of bandwidth that's allowable, um, implementing blackout periods or uh, lower uh, fidelity connections. And the point is to put these in a way that you would expect to possibly encounter while uh, using this in a manufacturing uh, facility. But uh, we want to do it in a controlled manner and understand the impact that those communication impairments have on the system performance. So for example, um, if the system loses connection with one of these um, other agents in the facility, maybe it has some behavior it is supposed to utilize when it loses connection, uh, you know, calling for help, returning to its uh, docking position, whatever, whatever it is. And using this test method, we can um, implement those conditions and actually uh, determine if that performance is observed or not. Then the newest subcommittee that we've just started is uh, for grasping and manipulation. Uh, so there's obviously been a lot of work in robotics uh, with robotic manipulators for various applications. Um, and we've, uh, through a, ver a couple of other standards groups, we've started developing these uh, test methods for grasping and manipulation. And we're looking at this kind of across the board for grasping and manipulation down from uh, on the bottom row here, this is just a robot doing a very uh, simple uh, test, test for finger strength, meaning how uh, much force that finger is able to exert on a test object. Um, so that's kind of looking at a very elemental grasping test method, uh, all the way up to uh, mobile manipulators, like what's shown in the top right, uh, which is a, a robot arm that is uh, attached to a mobile base that is in, expected to inspect uh, these various targets along a curve. Uh, this subcommittee is, is just starting and they're about to be registering some of their first uh, their first work items for standardization. Um, but it's, a, it's an exciting uh, next step for the committee because everything before was so focused on just ground vehicles. We now want to start to expand into these other areas. And I think grasping and manipulation is going to be a very, a very prominent one. Uh, this is just a look at the uh, different standards uh, and work items that uh, we've developed. Uh, there's, uh, I believe it's nine uh, accepted and published standards uh, since our inception. Uh, again, all focused on the uh, mobile robot area. Uh, we've got several work items registered as well. Um, and then the bottom three for uh, standard test methods for, um, uh, for manipulation and grasping uh, those are in process of being registered, and they'll see a lot of activity uh, moving forward. Now, one thing I wanted to just uh, point out for a lot of our tests is, um, and this is just for any sort of test and evaluation, there's always a, a uh, goal of reaching statistical significance, uh, particularly when we're dealing with industrial automation applications. Now, for... Um, any of our tests that we specify, uh, we don't require that a certain number of repetitions be performed, but we know that as you uh, demonstrate repeated performance over multiple repetitions, um, that it starts to uh, give you better statistics regarding whether or not that performance is expected to be achieved into the future. Uh, and what we mean by this is if you have a test like the one that's being shown here and you run it, um, you know, X number of times, it corresponds to a certain probability of success threshold, meaning the probability that you would continue to see that performance into the future and an associated confidence value. So because we're dealing with um, industrial automation, what we typically recommend is a minimum of 29 repetitions. 
So what that means is for any of those tests I was just describing, we would run it 29 times and expect to see uh, the same repeated performance uh, 29 times. When we do that, it corresponds to a 90% probability of success uh, with a 95% confidence. Now, uh, some within the committee uh, would like to see much higher probability of success and confidence, which is understandable because these are systems that are going to be running you know, for months on end um, in, in a facility. Now, if you look in the kind of top left of this table to that 459, if you were to run one of these tests 459 times with repeated uh, performance uh, every time, it would correspond to a 99% probability of success threshold and 99% confidence, um, which depending on uh, how much uh, you know, resources are available for performing the test, some people may um, actually go ahead and do that. Uh, there are certain um, entities within our um, standards committee that will develop automated test mechanisms so that they can take these systems and actually run them 459 times uh, on their own without having a human involved. Uh, it will give them much, much better statistics, um, but certainly is can be a little cumbersome. So for our purposes, we like to say 29 is a recommendation because it's usually pretty achievable. Um, and the 90 and 95% statistics that it corresponds to usually work for everybody else. Now, just the last bit I wanted to point out about ASTM F45 is we have a concept within that committee that we call the building blocks. And what we mean by that is while we have many different types of test methods that um, we've developed, as well as different um, standard practices, terminology, and guides, uh, we've designed them all so that you can uh, combine them when you need to. So what I mean is uh, we have a test method for navigation through a defined area. And for uh, someone who's looking to evaluate their system, that test, it gives you several metrics for a very you know, particular test case, but it may not be enough depending on what you want to evaluate. You may also want to uh, evaluate the system's ability to dock at the end of it, um, or you may want to implement a really um, challenging environmental condition as part of your defined area test. So what we've done as we design our standards is we allow them to be mixed and matched in this way that allows someone to take a standard test, apply a practice to it, uh, maybe utilize one of the guides to uh, tell them which variables to test. Um, and it allows for this very cohesive uh, set of performance standards um, so that if you want to run a very high fidelity test, you can work at it in this way. Or if you're just doing a very kind of low level initial test, you can use just one of the test methods on their own. Okay, um, I just wanna point out that ASTM F45 uh, does meet uh, twice a year for full committee meetings. Um, our next meeting is going to be held uh, in New Orleans, Louisiana in uh, October. Um, all of these meetings uh, should have hybrid options. I know we've started uh, doing that so that people can attend remotely. Um, and uh, the, these meetings you, are, you do are not required to be an ASTM member to attend. Uh, they are open for, for anybody. Um, so if anyone is interested in going a little bit deeper into um, each of these subcommittees, um, that event in October um, is, is a, good, a good primer on kind of really getting into how the committee functions. Um, and you know where you maybe uh, can assist us in our in our development. We also hold subcommittee meetings every month or every two months, um, which is where um, we go into much more um, uh, detailed discussion, really starting to write the standards, talking about particular language um, and certain concepts. Um, and I'd be happy to share um, these slides um, after the fact if needed. All right. And with that, I will uh, close out for uh, any sort of questions and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Adam, for such an insightful presentation. There's actually one question which uh, I sent to your box. Mm -hmm. And because of, uh, you know, in the interest of time, I would rather have you respond 
to that question via chat and uh, you can respond to everyone rather than just uh, the person that uh, sent the question. Sure, sure. You can, can, and if you don't mind, can I just address it right now? Yes, please yes. go ahead. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so uh, the OMG group has been brought up uh, several times within uh, some of our meetings for F4504. And um, to my knowledge, we have not yet made a distinct connection uh, with them, but we would we would really like to. Um, admittedly, F4504 is a subcommittee that um, has developed one standard and has been, we've been looking for more people to get involved because there's a lot more to be done. We just haven't really had the time to do it yet. Um, so if there is a particular contact within the OMG group that, um, is that Zachariah that you'd recommend that maybe I could reach out to, um, please send me the, their information. I'd, I'd be happy to do so. Thank you very much, uh, Adam, for um, taking that question. Uh, I believe there was a, a follow-up question. Hi, Adam, do you carry out any tests dealing with the integration of robotic systems from modular components? So uh, as of right now, we have not, but um, because of the expansion of the committee, um, it's something that I think is going to be very relevant. Um, particularly because of how modular a lot of those systems are now being made. Um, so within the communication and integration committee is probably another good topic for that committee to discuss. Um, and, you know, things like connecting robot arms to grippers, to sensors, all of that. There are a lot of um, fairly standard interfaces that are used, um, but there, as far as I understand, there has not been any sort of evaluation of um, the actual connection being made. Um, so I, I think that'd be a, a great topic for that committee to, to work on. So, you know, thank you. Thank you very much, Adam, once again. Um, I uh, invite all the attendees, and by the way, we have over 60 attendees, almost 70 as it stands, um, to send the questions through the chat. Um, you know, we want to, I want to give ample time to Professor Jean Bosco, who is our next speaker, to also, um, you know, have enough time to deliver his presentation and also answer questions. So without any further ado, I would like to invite uh, uh, Professor Bosco to um, upload this presentation while I provide a little bit uh, of a background uh, bio about Professor Bosco. Professor Bosco is uh, an associate professor of Meca Mechanitrus Engineering, forgive me, these are very highly technical terms. He's also a founding director of the Virtual Reality uh, Lab, VR in short, and Siemens Mechatronics Certification Center at Deden Kimati University of Technology uh, in Kenya. Apart from a long research and education career in Kenya and Rwanda, as well as in South Korea, uh, Professor Bosco has uh, published several papers related uh, to today's topic. And he's also a registered professional mechanical engineer by the Engineers Board of Kenya, EBK and the World Skills Kenya Mechatronics Expert by Technical and Vocational Education and Training Authority, TVETA. Um, Professor Bosco uh, is also uh, uh, known for his uh, work with uh, Siemens uh, AG in Germany, among other international organizations. Uh, he is currently a visiting research fellow at the Borgoni French Conti, forgive me for my French, um, in short is uh, UBFC, and that is in France. With that, uh, I would like to invite Professor Jean Bosco to begin his presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for your presentation, Maria. Uh, I am Gene Bosco, as Maria uh, explained. 
It is a great pleasure to be here in this presentation. Uh, I want to talk about uh, how Africa countries can benefit from international standard and robotics and autonomous systems. I really appreciated that Adam has uh, explained deeply about the standards, uh, but I want to go a little bit back because I ha can have an assumption. It is not a, uh, everybody who can get deeply the difference between these robotics we are talking about, a job can do for Africa and so forth. So I wanted to go a little bit uh, deeper to explain in, our, in what I can call it a little bit Lemani language so that uh, we can be able to understand uh, what is the challenge and what where can we be heading. As uh, Maria explained, uh, I am an associate professor. We have started also Siemens Mechatronics. At some point, I was uh, the Dean of School of Engineering. I was also the chairman for Mechatronics for eight years. I am the director of Siemens Center. I work with the University of Franche, Bourgogne Franche Comte. I have PhD student, master's student, and we have also collaboration of the student working on different areas, especially microfabrication and the robotics. Also, I work with the National, National Technic Engineer, National Init, that is the National <coughs> Polytechnic Institute of Toulouse. Uh, we again, we have industrial robotics, and we have students and using the robotics sometimes in the textile industry. Then I am a professional engineer with the Engineering Board of Kenya. We, work, we run also what is skills mechatronics and also I am a professional mechatronics uh, where we are, I, uh, we are running uh, the mechatronics for industries. And the, our work is to deal with the industrial grade uh, hardware. Yeah. Uh, where we are, yeah, definitely we are not in Nairobi, we are in Kenya, but uh, at 150 kilometers from Nairobi, and uh, we are in a place called Nyeri. All this work we are doing, uh, we are trying to make sure we will be part of the Sands Park, which is going to be for Mount Kenya, uh, Mount Kenya region Sands Park, where industries will be having their business and uh, we will be involved in either training the professionals or having the machines there. So far we have STM, that is a, the STR, that is a semiconductor industry in the university, which is running under this sense park, but we are joining uh, all of us in the time, coming time. Uh, what I want to talk about, I want to say in the Lamban language or in the, how the standard define what we call a robot. And uh, I, we will talk about autonomous operation versus uh, autonomous machines. Then I will talk about industrial robot and the uh, industrial and the automation of systems uh, because industrial and autonomous systems, what we define as last. And I will talk about a little bit on international standard about them and what African can benefit. Then uh, I will give a simple uh, touch on a project on robotics, what we are trying to do in robot collaboration, what we call impedance control, uh, where we want a robot to work with the human and they collaborate, uh, but not, not avoiding it, but uh, help each other. Uh, when we talk about here, we are saying what is exactly what what exactly the robot is. Uh, when we talk about a robot, we are trying to talk about uh, we look at the challenge we have with the standards or the challenge we have with the uh, European market versus Asian market. When you go to Asian market, they define a robot as any uh, any mechanical mechatronics device which is equipped with the kinematics pairs joints with a certain result of degree of freedom of movement so that it can be able to manipulate an object. So if in Asia market, uh, I mean Eastern uh, market, which is uh, Japan, Korea, uh, and the China, uh, they talk about that as a robot. But when you go to Western market, which is Europe and America, they bring their more strict on what a robot can be because they are talking about, you look at the complex requirement of a robot, you look at the control system performance, then you look at the overall capability of a robot. That is what we can define as a robot. So uh, here for us to understand much uh, uh, a little bit simpler, we look at a robot as a part which uh, system which has a 
seven parts. You put these seven parts together, but a robot can be defined if you have more than three joints. If you have three or more joints, you can make a robot. But uh, here we are talking about just a simple basic robot where you have the base, you have the shoulder, you have the arm, you have the elbow, then you have the wrist and you have the hand so that you can be able to manipulate as you do with your hand. Uh, what we are looking at, if you look at this robot, it has six joints, one, two, three, four, five, six, but it has seven parts, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you have seven parts, but you have six joints, so you can be able to manipulate and move uh, move something to uh, from one, right, one side to another side. I will, I will show it in the next slide. But uh, what we need to understand, as I said, uh, the, we needed to follow at least the international standard. Well, how would this international standard uh, define uh, the robot? How international standard they talk about it? Because for the purpose of this presentation, uh, here we have a Kuka robots. Uh, we, here it was uh, in the University of Bourgogne, uh, where we are doing work. We are trying to show our student how, what robot can be able to do. Uh, but in a simple way, a robot in an international standard, they define it as any automatically controlled, uh, uh, any automatically controlled, uh, reprogrammable multipurposes and the manipulator program in three or more axes. It can be fixed or it can be in a mobile, uh, but it has an application. It can have an application in natural automation. That is after ISO 20, uh, 2012. But when you look at that definition, it allows you to say it is reprogrammable. So it means you can be able to give it a uh, desired trajectory. So it means this is what uh, Adam was talking about when he's talking about putting the sensors and uh, control the robot, make it move right, left. Uh, they can be to do different logistics. Other things you can allow it to have multiple purposes. So it means you can print it to bring it in different uh, application. Other part is uh, if you have a three or more axes, you can be able to move in a 3D space. So it means you have uh, you have the possibility to do different work in a complex spatial uh, uh, system or spatial motion. Then you have the mobile, it means you have the possibility to extend the workpiece uh, via the mobile robot. And uh, here we talk about the, another axis, which we call seven axis. You know, we are talking about six axis, but we are assuming if you have this robot and you try to move it maybe in a linear, in another linear platform, it is an industrial robot, which should work in a, those six axis. Uh, but now you add another one where it can move right or left. Uh, when we go to this uh, autonomous operation versus, uh, we are talking about autonomous operation versus autonomous machines. Because uh, in this sector, people try to define, how do you define these two terms? You are talking about autonomous machine, uh, autonomous operation, because uh, this machine must be autonomously do a certain work, but an operator can do the program to define the trajectory of this machine. So it means if you have uh, as an operator defined that trajectory and he's not putting much other inputs, after he defined like I am doing here on this robot, uh, this is just a universal robot, which you can be able to set a program and say the trajectory you want it to pass, and then it can do a certain job in industry. But when you talk about this autonomous, you are talking about a robot which after which we autonomously do the work. It means it will operate without the whole cycle, without intervention of uh, a human. Definitely, uh, these terms, uh, they are still a bit varying because I think uh, at some point, Adam mentioned the driverless, or uh, unmanned or high automated, but these are the things that keep coming uh, from the standard. But general idea, we are talking about an operation which can be autonomous, but you need to allow someone to be able, someone like an operator can help it, can do the program, then it will follow it. Uh, when we talk about the robots, we can talk about how different are these robots, how do we 
we talk we are talking about these industrial robots uh or we are talking about robotics and autonomous systems uh, we are looking at the capabilities and the possibility how this robot works and we look at international standard what international standard talk about because you can have a manipulation robot because this robot we are seeing here it can be able to do a certain job this job this robot can do it can be in production it can be uh, in attending it can be in operating can be in transport so it can do many jobs that is one type another type you can talk about technological robots when we are talking about this technological robot we are talking about robot we can use maybe for example you want to do painting you want to do welding and other jobs and you have also universal robots which now you can do different kind of work like the one i was showing previously and also you can decide to have a special robot you have designed specifically for example you can have a red machine or a milling machine then you develop a certain robot to help uh, this machine to work uh, so that maybe it can be giving work piece changing and so forth depending on the specific task you want this robot to do but if we look at the standard themselves uh, the standard uh, STM, I think Adam has explained, ISO, uh, other international standards, they have defined uh, these different robots and with also the safety, because as you talk about the robot, you look also at the safety, the safety requirement for these robotics, because here there are robots which you can talk about the mobile mining machines, you can talk about the mobile uh, uh, mach machines, you can talk about the earth moving machinery, you can talk about uh, agriculture or agricultural machinery, you can talk about uh, forest machinery, you can talk about construction, you can talk about uh, industrial cranes, you can be talking about industrial trucks and the GVs, and you can talk about industrial robotics. All of these, they have different standards uh, depending on the uh, uh, what do you want to do with the robots? So that means to get, it tells us in a nutshell, uh, they are standard for all these robots. That is what uh, Adam explained much more on specifics, what they have for different robots. But when we look at them, we need to look at this robot standard by looking how they are really uh, defined because you need to look at the safety of this robot. And then you say, okay, there is a robot which can be an autonomous, so it means you have different uh, what I can call set of set of operation of that robot. Because as you have the tractors, mach other machinery, industrial machinery, or you have earth moving machine, or you have the mining, or you have the uh, the industrial machinery, or you have industrial truck. All of them they have different standards which are existing, and uh, it depends at which level you want it to be able to operate with this robot. But what is more important, I'm sorry here I have managed to get, I got uh, some standard from uh, uh, ISO and others. Uh, I didn't manage to get your standard, Adam, on time. So I hope next time I will refer to uh, your standard to see how do we, they are related. But what is more important, industrial sector, there are many uh, standard because the automated work machine are much coming in and uh, they are in uh, different sectors, they are adapting them. But when you look at this picture, what it shows us, it is showing us how, where do you place them? Because there are much more machines which are on the site or operation environment and the other which you can talk about autonomous and the mixed fleet. And also there is on board, what we can call when you go to on board, safety and the, and the sensor systems, that is where you talk about much the sensor regarding this uh, robotics. When we look at uh, monitoring this robot, because sometimes we, when we talk about the robot, for us Africans, we come sometimes worried about the safety of this robot. And then you need to know the zone you operate because you have the factory uh, or operational site, which is the, the biggest site. So it means when you have someone on this blue line, towards this blue line, it means you can have a monitored person. So it means a person can be working that plant but it's not necessary to be too much cautious. And also you can have a machine also which is not unmonitored. But when you go to autonomous and operation, what they have defined as operational zone, autonomous operational zone, you have to be 
uh, monitored. And if even, even a person, even a machine must be monitored and the person must be having a tag because uh, this is a place which is not completely safe. Then you have another side where you have now semi, you know, you can, you can have autonomous or semi-autonomous semi machines where at some point you can have the machine working alone or you can have machine working with people so you are collaborating with this machine and so forth. But uh, what is important when you wanted to make this robot and install them, that is the reason why we need the standard, the infrastructure or operating area requirement should be identified because you need to know if this machine maybe you are dealing with it, maybe at some point it will need it to be fueled or this machine we need to have a control room, where do you place it? If you want to have the communication network, how do you do them? So uh, the international standard always introduce the autonomous operation zones and how this should work. Uh, where do you Professor look at Bosco, the... Professor yes. Bosco, <clears throat> forgive me for interrupting you. <laughs> I, I am enjoying you. I'm, I'm sure we're all enjoying your presentation and I'm concerned because I've been notified that the French interpretation is not working. So uh, forgive me, but I would like the interpreters to uh, write to me or to Dan uh, regarding the interpretation, because I think it's very important that we have the French interpretation. Okay, okay, I can so hold on a bit. Yes, if you don't mind, just one second uh, to see the reaction on that, uh, um, on, on this issue. Okay, okay. Then, if you can hear me, I've reached out to the interpreters, both interpreters. We still don't have the French interpretation. Okay, I'm following up on the same. Uh, sorry for that. It will be rectified in the next few minutes. Okay. So for the sake of time, we still have uh, almost half an hour. Professor Bosco, please bear with me while we try to sort out the interpretation uh, issue. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, we're mostly welcome. It is working now. Please proceed. Thank you very much. Professor Bosco, please proceed. Okay. Uh... I was on, uh, I have to go. Uh, I think at one point you stopped me when I was uh, somewhere here. Yeah. Uh, I was trying to explain uh, when you deal with the uh, industry and uh, you needed to start because the question here, in Africa, somebody wanted to ask to start a plant and he wanted to know what are the requirements. The, what the standard, what international standard provided to that. That is where I was discussing about monitored and the unmonitored person or machines. So it means when you are in this bruise zone, uh, it means you are at a point where it is not too much necessary for this person to be monitored because he's a, a little bit he's a, on a safe zone when we are talking about industrial uh, robotics. Uh, then uh, the standard also defined the autonomous zone where uh, autonomous operating zone where if a person is there, he must have a tag and uh, uh, the machine there must be monitored and all, anything happening in that zone must be monitored because of the safety issues. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, much more inside where we have the task planners, where we have the navigation, we have, have operation, where we have the safety and so forth. So where this all this system and the controls happens. So it means inside that, kind of zone. Also, you have the control and the people who can help the intervention in case if need be. Uh, that is the reason why the industry and the standards uh, has international standard has managed to achieve this so that the, we can be able to benefit from it. Now, the benefit here for the robot, for if we look at the robot and autonomous system uh, standards to Africans, we look at, uh, if we look at it critically, you realize uh, this robot, this autonomous 
a systems that is the reason why we are actually when we talk about sometimes you tell people mechatronics they hear robotics uh, they hear it is the same thing but uh, robotics can be a, a one part of mechatronics but not necessarily the whole of it but if you go to program a robot and design it and control it and wire it so if you are developing it as as a whole it can be a mechatronics but now here if you look at it the world is reshaping uh, toward the changing the healthcare, changing the food production and the biodiversity management. So it means uh, in this case, if we want to remain relevant, we have to follow the to get uh, the assistance because these uh, international standards will help us to, it is like to replay a, a big role because here we are talking about SDG, UNSTG associated opportunities. And also if you look at this standard, they can help us to take the opportunities which are there in SDG, but also we can uh, look at how it can alleviate uh, the threat. Sometimes we have some threat which we have not yet in this UN SDG, when we are talking about this development goals and we are talking about manufacturing and others, we are talking about, we are looking at what can be the threat versus the opportunities because some Africans think if we bring this robot, they will replace human uh, support, you, you must replace human uh, intervention industries. Or some of people think maybe they can uh, support human activities or they can foster the innovation or they can uh, enhance the remote access. But for me, I can see it is so much a supporting uh, a human and also it can make him to do more innovation because uh, it will reduce the delays uh, of the achieving and also it will allow the remote access because it can allow you to monitor and improve the monitoring system. So it means uh, when we look at this, we need to advise maybe the policy makers in next iteration for SDG, uh, they should make sure that uh, it must be clear so that uh, we have the standard considered explicitly because uh, if we explain them explicitly, it will avoid uh, reversing the progress or exhibiting uh, inequalities. Uh, so when we are talking about this, we don't want anything to hinder or to bring us back or to delay us what we are trying to achieve. So that is only why the first approach, uh, the first benefit, it can be uh, to look at this standard in a positive way. Uh, the second thing, we look at the impact of this standard because we needed to see how this standard will help or can help to improve, maybe for example, the surgical procedures. Uh, uh, how can we enhance them? How can we integrate uh, this robotics? In Rwanda, during the COVID, they brought the robot to test the temperature because everybody was fearing about COVID. So nobody was ready to go near the patient of, rob of uh, a patient. Then they brought, uh, they brought the robotics, which we were helping to, to test the COVID. Uh, also, we look at the transformation of agriculture and also to be able to have like the weed control. And also we can be able to contribute to biodiversity conservation because we need to control so uh, the, uh, to have a control of invasive uh, species because robotic can be able to help us to be able to do uh, the selection and identification more than human. Then when you look at uh, international student, uh, international uh, standard, will help us also uh, to, alleviate some, to alleviate some concern about the change of the market. Because as we are saying, uh, uh, people may think uh, this standard will come to assist us. They have a concern, but this concern about the change of market, maybe some people think it can influence the pollution and the waste because these are the mechanical systems and so forth. Or some people can also think they can replace the normal com living component of the nature. Like now here we are talking about, we are talking about like, for example, pollinators. But this is not really an issue because for us, what we needed to look at, we needed to look at uh, the benefit, much more the benefit of this robotics, the more than uh, what we may think uh, may bring issues. Uh, last but not least in this case, uh, there is no systematic understanding on how standard may impact the society and the environment when we look at it on our Africa context. Uh, and we, know, we may not know also how this standard can be able to facilitate or to imp impede the delivery of the SDG. Uh, 
So it, it is important for us to have uh, uh, this international standard so that we can be able to move our industrialization or Africa industrialization. Uh, I can go very fast to what we are doing in our lab. In our lab, we have a project we are working with uh, uh, in it in Toulouse, that is uh, Institute Polytechnic de Toulouse. Uh, what we are trying to do, we are doing a common, we are making a common manufacturing technology platform between the two university because uh, this will be a long-term uh, collaboration, which will be focusing on the masters and the PhD, but in the area of uh, industrial 4.0. What we are going to do in this platform, we will have a cyber a cyber and the physical system. So we'll have a cooker robot in unit to a tarp, and then we'll have a VR platform, the station uh, with a digital twin at the Dedan Kimadi. Already we have tested the digital twin. I will show you uh, uh, the, the lab we have, the platform, and then we have to have the crowd service. So we are using also this advantage in Kenya. We have Kenet, which will help us to be able to have access to the cloud. And they, will, uh, they, they give us a little bit, you know, the crowd like uh, Mindsphere or other cloud sometimes become expensive. Uh, what, what is the motivation? Why do we want to do this project? Because we are trying to see, uh, we need to collaborate with the robot. We, need, we, don't need, we don't have to avoid always the robot so that we go to safety zone and so forth. We can collaborate with this robot. So uh, what are we doing? We're increasing the flexibility and the activity because uh, we need to produce uh, to get improve of uh, worker, worker experience. Because if you work with the robot, sometimes you get more uh, experience in the, the work. Why? Human being is intelligent. Human being can have reasoning and decisions. That is why we need this impedance control. And then we have human being has an expertise. That is the benefit of human. When you go to robot, you realize the robot has a physical ability and it has consistency and precision, which human being doesn't have. And also it can have longevity and uh, high productivity. But the main challenge we will have to look at in this project, we look at ergonomics and the shift. Then we compare with the performance trade-off because we don't want it to have, uh, if we look at the performance, what we want it to achieve versus what it can cause, we need to look at both. And then we, human being, definitely human being safety is very, very important in the, all the activity we are doing. Currently, what we are doing because of the technology, uh, we are developing a platform. We have been starting, we have started to develop the platform. We will use industrial IoT platform. Uh, it will be adopted with this unified M space uh, architecture. Uh, this uh, UNS uh, will use uh, a hub spoke model, which is a communication uh, network. Uh, which will allow any component to be within the ecosystem. It is like you are creating a hub where all, it is like, if you talk about this, we assume uh, many of us, we have the French speaker and English speaker, but me, I have uh, much more understanding. Maybe sometimes when I go to France, I see all the roads and the highways. Uh, the, end point is, uh, the end point is Paris. Uh, so it means you have no problem when you are in France. If you go to any highway, it will take you to Paris. Why Paris they made it? Paris is the hub. Anywhere you want to connect, you go through Paris. This is the same method UNS is using, where you use it as a hub. Then uh, all the information uh, and whatever data they can go to that they can be distributed through that system. Uh, again, the good thing, it allows the scaling and evolution. In the, again, it has good security from the physical. If you look at the uh, open system in the connection model, you look at the physical, you look at the other of the transport and application layers because they are in this open system interconnection, you have seven layers. But if you look at it from the base layer, the middle layer of transport, and you go to application layer, you will find with this UNS, it is uh, secured. That is why we are using it in this project. So in conclusion, we, we can say uh, for us African, there is no doubt we, we need this uh, international standard, but we need it to think because when it comes to human robot collaboration, uh, we still have challenges uh, over ergonomics and, uh, and the SEFT versus performance trade-offs I was talking about. But to be specific, if I talk about, look at the SEFT issue, there are still some problems 
problems which need to be attended internationally. I believe Adam and his team will, are looking at it. Uh, the sensor requirement, because the sensor requirement, when you have a robot, it needs to detect human if you are collaborating, because uh, if you touch it, in, uh, if you are working and uh, maybe you are in this platform, I will show you where you want the robot to work with you together. So it means it must detect your forces. And uh, another, the risk of the robot sometimes is the collision with human. So the robot work in movement, I think at some point I showed a robot here when we are in the lab, somewhere here, I presented something when I was starting. Uh, yes, uh, 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 sorry, sorry. Uh, okay, I want to show here. This robot was almost hitting my colleague. If you look at it, it was moving, but this person, when it missed that uh, part, it was to pick. The person went to pick it, but uh, the robot was almost uh, hitting the person. You can see uh, the lady is near, but the robot was almost hitting her. So sometimes this robot can collide with human. Uh, so again, other things we look at, we look at if the sensor of the robot fail, definitely they will not detect uh, the human presence if the sensor itself has failed. So what we are trying to do uh, in conclusion, we are looking at the technology of virtual reality. This is a next technology, which can help maybe to alleviate those risks of physical uh, collision during uh, uh, the commissioning of the project. Uh, this is uh, where I can stop, and uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, this is uh, our lab uh, when the French ambassador and her team and uh, our president of the university visited our lab during COVID to see what we are trying to achieve. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bosco, for such an insightful presentation. Uh, I like the videos that you shared, the pictures that you shared, and above all, the information that you shared with us. I was monitoring the, the chat. Some people are afraid that uh, the use of uh, robots will lead to uh, unemployment. Um, I, I, I don't know if this uh, webinar, with this webinar, um, you know, things will be clarified. <clears throat> However, I believe, uh, um, you know, the, the topic is very relevant, especially with uh, the African agenda 2063, um, which includes uh, industrializing uh, the continent. And now with the AFCFTA uh, agreement that we have in place and which, uh, came into force in, um, Jan on January 2021. Um, I think this is a very relevant topic. I, I was also pleased to see that uh, we have uh, our dear friend, Margaret Lungu from the African Union. I hope uh, she carries this uh, message uh, to her colleagues and others in the continent. With that, I would like to open the floor for questions. Um, those questions that were sent uh, via chat, please address them, uh, both panelists ad address them uh, um, via chat. But those questions that would be, I mean, would like to, um, whoever would like to ask a question, I'm happy to ask them to um, unmute or ask the participant to, uh, unmute themselves. So this is the right time to ask your question and to be heard. Uh, I, I have seen some people on chat uh, uh, trying to talk about, uh, I think I have seen uh, uh, one comment by, uh, by Zachary. Uh, I think is a is a, a comment, not really a question. Uh, he's saying uh, the robot. Uh, I guess that safety standard for module will uh, uh, will be critical in autonomous autonomous robot as we solve the SDG. As you have, okay. So this is uh, is a comment. Thank you, Zachary, for 
for the comment. Uh, this is very important because as we are trying to go towards this SDG, uh, as Africans, we need to have really the correct standard and the correct understanding on, of uh, when especially comes to this robotics. This is in new areas to us, but to, we don't have really much a choice if we wanted to move very fast as uh, uh, industrialized. Some people say we are in industry too, but I don't believe we are in two because we are, uh, if we go to use of internet and the other ICT infrastructures, I think Africans also we are doing well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Zakari. I think that is, uh, uh, I think another person, Akeju, uh, uh, Akeju was saying uh, the automation will eliminate human error. Uh, I think that is what we have talked about the precision. I think Adam can say something on that because he's, uh, yeah, uh, he's much on developing now the sensors and the, the standards. Yeah. Yes, I was going to ask Adam to please address that. Yeah. So. Um... There's, I mean, there's definitely a lot of potential for robot systems to remove some of the human error and have, you know, higher production rates and everything. But I think what needs to be um, understood is just kind of the, the limitations of them as well, which is a lot of current robot systems can do one or maybe two tasks like the previous presentation was showing. Um, they can do those really well, but when you have to move them to something new, or if there are errors, there can be a lot of you know problems there, depending, um, which is a lot of why some of the ASTM test methods are being developed so we can better understand what their capabilities are um, and know kind of where their gaps are so they can try to improve that capability. But as for the impact it might have, say, on um, you know workforce, uh, there's a lot of other efforts that will look at how to uh, reskill or retrain workers to actually be able to work with these systems. Because the reality is you don't just set up a system and have it run. It has engineers that maintain it. They maintain the whole fleet. There's a lot of other tasks. Um, so I, I typically try not to think about it as people that would, would become, let's say, unemployed, but rather um, their, the way that they would use these systems will change. So their, their, their jobs may change. There may be some additional education, um, but it still requires a lot of human involvement. And Adam, maybe you want to kind of give a gist of uh, how uh, robot, robots uh, and robotics and auto autonomous systems have improved or, or kind of a galvanized um, industrialization in the Western part of the world, which we are right now, right? Yeah, um, it's definitely um, become very prominent to the point where I wouldn't be surprised if I found any manufacturing facility in the US that didn't have some form of robotics. Um, but still, in most cases, it's being used for very, very repetitive, um, very kind of simple tasks. There are other organizations like uh, Boeing or, or Siemens, um, like what was mentioned earlier, that will use much more advanced systems for building uh, airplanes and um, you know, some of these you know, really, really uh, high-tech systems that are uh, also very you know, narrowly focused uh, and supported by, you know, billion dollar industries. Um, what we're starting to see now, though, is that some of the small and medium manufacturers, so, you know, not the not the big names, just the smaller, smaller folks, they're getting more access to robot systems because the price is coming down. Um, and that's because of just how um, ubiquitous they are across the continent. Thank you very much, Adam. I, several questions came. Um, I'm going to read a couple of them. Is there a website or an easy way to reach document where one can get to read the standards? Um, I'm not sure if he's referring to ASTM standards or ARSO standards. Yeah, so, so at least 
ASTM mm -hmm. standards, as long as you're a member, you can access them. Um, I think ISO standards you may need to purchase individually. I can't recall. Yes. Yeah. Specifically, when you you uh, um, an MOU partner, you have access, uh, free access to our standards. So I asked Mr. Peter Mutuku to write to me. Um, I will give further details on how to um, access the standards. Professor Bosco, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was saying uh, it is very important to uh, to read to get the standard from every country. I believe it has a bill of standard. And like today morning when I was looking for the standard, uh, I I am um, I think Mr. Zachary he sent me uh, the standard to refer to. So standard has to be bought is a challenge, but also there are many publications which sometimes touch on uh, different standards. So. People listening to us, I can say when you read uh, some standard review on the publications, you can get them, but uh, some specific standard, especially for industrial use with all the details about that standard, definitely uh, it needed to be bought. But uh, with country, different country, this kind of collaboration we have with uh, also has with the uh, 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 STM, uh, it means you can be able to, I think, to help each other to get uh, the information, especially for Africans, we are still uh, really uh, having challenge to get the standard, but uh, I think it is very important to note so that we can uh, be able to assist our colleagues who need I think uh, Mr. Uh, I think uh, uh, people we can maybe get maybe in contact with our so, our so team and the, yourself Maria to see how the people this question can have answers. Eh? Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you Professor, Professor Bosco. I know you have to leave for another engagement in about two minutes but if you could answer this question um, to what extent can African governments control its development um, as we promote robotics and autonomous systems? This came on the chat. Uh, this is a difficult question uh, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, they are, uh, when you look at it, only here in Kenya, at some point you find in the government or in the parliament, uh, you find engineers, and the researchers in the parliament. We, you can find many engineers even today. The person who is vying to be president, His Excellency Raira Odinga, he's an engineer. So much likely uh, these things will be uh, solved as we are getting engineers and researchers in policy makers. I am part of our, our stakeholders for CFTA. Uh, continental free Africa continental free trade. We try to discuss, we keep addressing, we keep uh, meeting different uh, institutions to discuss about these technologies. Uh, and I believe uh, as the decision makers, as we become a part of decision makers, I can say, because uh, if we are there watching uh, the standard for this robotics and the, the countries will not buy ideas. And it is for us, you know, there is nothing like a country, a country is ourselves. So when you say the government, who are you talking about? Sometimes we say, ourselves, we needed to think about how can we collaborate, have the webinar like this, conferences, meetings, invite the stakeholders, then to make sure that the government understand because where we are, economy today is really very, we are here if I have, uh, economies are on its knee, so it means we need to really embrace this robotics so that we avoid, we, we, can become, we become more competitive as a other countries. But as the government, on the government side, I believe the policymakers and the organization uh, need to continue giving this kind of talk, seminars. That is also the main job we are doing on a daily basis. I believe uh, it, it, will be, it will be understood. If I look at mechatronics itself today, it is the first program in the university which has more attractive for the student. So, but in it too, in 2014 or 2013, we graduated only 27 students in mechatronics, but today we don't, we can't have, uh, actually have to refuse to admit the student. So it means this robotics and the control is going to be really, it is being appreciated at a government level. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bosco. I 
have to uh, allow, well, first of all, thank both uh, panelists and also let them uh, go at this point because they do have other commitments. Uh, I, uh, uh, on behalf of ASTM, uh, thank uh, both uh, Professor Bosco and Mr. Adam Norton. We will continue, however, with the webinar, not for long, but we need to hear the closing remarks from uh, uh, Mr. Okungu and also um, some announcements that I may make. So thank you, Mi Professor Bosco. Thank you, Mr. Thank Martin. you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now, um, before I hand over to uh, Mr. Okungu, I want to assure you that um, the questions and the comments that you sent through the chat will be addressed. We'll do that offline. Um, if you haven't sent us your emails, please do so. Um, we can also get your email through the list, uh, the participate, uh, participant, participants uh, list. Um, so please be rest assured that we'll get back to you. With that, I would like to um, invite uh, Mr. Kungu to give us the closing remarks. Um, as I said, um, this webinar is a series, is part of a series of webinars, and I hope this particular webinar enlightened you on the advantage of combining traditional production methods with higher forms of technology, which in turn allows for factory managers and business owners to exponentially increase their production rates and boost their bottom lights. Uh, lines rather. Um, with that, I I'm going to hand over to Mr. Okungu. Thank you very much. Mr. Okungu. Mr. Okungu, you need to unmute yourself. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry, I was doing some logistics. As we know, it is an election period. I'm working from home, so some logistics on the uh, in the background. Sorry for that. Uh, Thank you once more, and thank our uh, experts uh, with us all this time. It has been a great moment, great opportunity to hear about the future of robotics in Africa. Uh, manufacturing and industrialization. In fact, uh, there is an, uh, a paper which has already been done by the UNCTAD, paper number 20, uh, a paper number 50, this is uh, an UNCTAD policy brief on robotics and industrialization, uh, number 50, 2015. If an expert has got the opportunity to make reference it elaborates on the uh, on the benefits and the future of robotics in Africa and in the developing countries, and it highlights. I've seen some of the charts, and it really gives uh, great answers, like uh, one on how the government can deal with robotics, because surely for Africa to benefit from the global economy, we must embrace digitalization, and robotics is part of it. And then uh, the paper calls on the needs for a whole government approach that guarantees macroeconomic stability and availability of investment finance. Uh, an approach that adopts supportive industrial policy and educational policy that uh, addresses the issues of automation. Then a policy that pursues an industrialization strategy aimed at the deployment of automation technologies that boosts the upgrading of labor skills and the international competitiveness of farms. Uh, you remember we are doing a lot based on the competitiveness of our NS, uh, our, our SMEs. Uh, this one is through standardization and the certifications. And then an approach that expands social safety nets and redistributive policies to address the adverse effects on employment and inclusiveness that will occur, at least in the short term. So 
this webinar, I think, has enriched uh, our perspective about the robotics and the, the autonom uh, autonomous technology in our industrialization and manufacturing under the sad fact that it is here to stay with that and Africa must participate for us. It was even currently, if you look at the FCFTA agreement, the structure is on the adoption of digitalization in Africa and e-commerce. And there are so many initiatives taking place. So we have got no choice but to adjust in terms of policies. I want to thank uh, once more uh, the experts, the ASO members, I've seen the regional organization, the AU, Maggie Lungu participating. Um, so also glad uh, to see some of our directors of member states organizations, because that means the leadership is concerned and we are very happy to see them uh, participating in this capacity building for the member states. Uh, mostly also may I take this opportunity to extend a word of hello to my colleagues from the Central Secretariat. As we said, we are working from home, connection through the email, the WhatsApps, and monitoring all that is happening at the Central Secretariat. I'm happy to see you all here, my colleagues. And with this, and on behalf of the Secretary General, we want to thank the STM Secretariat, the STM International once more for the organization, the initiatives, and always the support and facilitations that has made this webinar series to be a success. With us, I want to thank you all and may God bless you. As we also pray for Kenya to have peace in this electioneering period, because with the peace in the sure of us as central secretaries hosted in Kenya by the government of the Republic of Kenya, stability and peace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kungo, for your closing remarks and uh, for the tremendous uh, support that you have shown um, throughout uh, this partnership. I would like to assure once again uh, to all the attendees that uh, both the slides and the, the recording of this webinar will be shared uh, with you. Uh, at some point soon. I uh, can assure you that will be this week. With that, I want to thank you very much for participating actively on the question and answer, and above all, for taking time to be here. So thank you again for your kind attention and enjoy the rest of the day. I will ask then if we have a minute to take a screenshot of uh, all the participants, uh, please uh, turn their cameras on. I'm assuming that most uh, people have uh, left. <laughs> then, are you going ahead? Okay. Oh, yes, I'm taking. Uh, we, have, okay. we have a good number. Okay, great. Go ahead. Happy to see you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I've taken the last one. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Asante Sana. Asante Sana, Pierre. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.